gracious Heavenly Father, God has come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together and feast on your word. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would take charge of this hour, that he would filter out all of that which is not of you, all of that which is ignorance and foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were, I believe, at the 25th verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We've been looking at what's normally called the Lord's Supper, the expression, the Lord's Supper. Uh, the word supper is a Greek word that, that, that doesn't by any stretch of the imagination mean snack. It's the primary word for the main meal of the day, the, the feasting type meal. It's the main meal of the day and our fellowship together in the Lord Jesus Christ is our main spiritual meal. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In Hebrews 10 14 we read, For by one offering He's perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, let's go back to our 11th chapter of, of Corinthians. This is my body. I pointed out that the text is saying that it, that it wasn't the bread. There's a break there in the grammar. What he's offering is his body. What the Lord Jesus Christ is doing, I believe, is illustrating that his body is our nourishment, not the bread that he was passing out, but his body. That's our nourishment. Now, I had a, a few questions from my last video, and I appreciate all of those, those questions and all of those comments. I may have left some people with the wrong impression uh, that uh, they thought that what I was suggesting was that we didn't have any reason to partake of the Lord's Supper, and, and I hope I didn't, didn't, didn't leave that impression. That's not the impression I meant to leave. Um, in Hebrews chapter 10, a body thou hast prepared for me. Why did Jesus have to have a body prepared? Well, clearly there's something different about that body. Now, think of all that's involved in that, that little expression. Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. We know his body didn't see corruption. Uh, there was no decay, and that is the body that we feast upon uh, every day. It's not something that we just do once. His body bore our sin. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We stand before God righteous because of what Christ did. We've been made the righteousness of God in Him. And that's true of every single one of us. When you do this, you show His death until He comes. His death. His death which was necessary for our redemption. And now we feast on Him until He comes. What possible body uh, is it that would have, uh, would have uh, died on the cross? Kind of, what kind of a body would, would die on the cross and then uh, we would speak of it coming again? The, I, I, I hope you don't miss this because the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is intrinsic in the text. 
how often do we join together as members of his body, the church? How often do we join together in an observance of the Lord's Supper where that we observe in type what we're really saying? Please don't get me wrong. I'm, I haven't argued against observing what we call the Lord's Supper any more than I would argue against water baptism. I, you know, I wouldn't argue against it. I, w I would argue that it's not necessary for redemption. But if you want to perform some physical act to illustrate a grand spiritual truth, there's, there's nothing wrong in that. If you want to wear a wedding ring, you know, to prove that you're married, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't make you married. It's simply an illustration of something that you want to portray. We gather together and we illustrate what the scriptures are teaching, that, and that is that we feast on the Lord, both His body and His blood. And we saw that he that doesn't drink my blood and eat my flesh has no part in me. So we, we illustrate that in what's called the Lord's Supper, but it isn't actually the Lord's Supper. It's an illustration of it. The Lord's Supper is our feasting on Christ. Uh, it's, uh, and it's our feasting on Him. It's the main meal, okay? It's uh, the primary me meal. That's... And that's not true of the cracker and the in the in the uh, uh, the wine or grape juice that we drink. What we do when we observe the Lord's Supper is illustrate in the physical type the spiritual uh, nourishment. We gather together to feast on the Lord. We're drinking His blood and eating His flesh because that's the only spiritual nourishment that we have. You know, we don't get spiritual nourishment from cocktail shrimp or Arby's. Uh, roast beef sandwiches. We get spiritual nourishment from what Jesus Christ did for us. We do not get any spiritual nourishment for what we think we must do for Christ. Hebrews tells us his body isn't offered over and over and over again. Uh, most of you here, I think... Uh, that, that watch these videos, I, f I feel fairly certain that most of you are Protestants, uh, not Catholics. Christ died for those who are His. He died in their place, a substitutionary death, and they will hear, they will believe because they've been redeemed. He doesn't suddenly bear your sins when you decide to accept Him or receive Him. He's already done it. Dearly beloved, if your great, 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 great granddaughter or grandson who hasn't even been born yet is a member of the body of Christ, those sins are forgiven. Hasn't even been born yet. He bore the sins of his people. It's the grand theme of the scriptures. For by the disobedience of the one, the many, note, note the word many, the many were made sinners, that's God's elect. Even so, by the obedience of the one, the many, the elect, are made righteous. They had nothing to do with it. They were made righteous by His obedience, not by anything they did. I don't want you to pass over this. This, this is my body, which is for you. Okay, if that body is not the body of the almighty, eternal, majestic God who created the heavens and the earth, who hung the stars in the sky, then Scripture means nothing. He's God of very God, and it's His body. It never saw corruption. It was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God, which we were, but it didn't see corruption. And this body was justified in the Spirit. Justified in the Spirit. Second Timothy. God was propitiated. He was satisfied. What Christ did was sufficient. Nothing to be added. And when we gather together, as we gather together to study His Word, as we're doing right now, 
were being fed with the, the grand spiritual truth that because He was made sin for us, we have no more conscience of sin. No more conscience of sin. How many Christians do you know who have conscience of sin? Who are worried about sin, fret over sin, concerned about sin, or debilitated because of personal sin? We have no more conscience of sin. I think we ought to carry that same grand truth over into our partaking of the Lord's Supper. Because there are many who don't. If, uh, if I believe God, I have no more conscious guilt of sin. And the only way that that can be true is if this body in our present context is the body of God Almighty. I believe that the incarnate Christ is the, is the body and the subject here. And we, as a group of believers, are members of that one body. And He's the head, as, as, we, as, as we saw in the opening verses of this chapter. Christ is the head. So that's what we do. We're feasting together on the fact that Jesus Christ was made sin for us by shedding His blood. His blood represents His death in our place. His body represents that which was made sin. I think the observance of something physical has become so important that many have missed what communion illustrates. You know, there's a mind shaft of wealth beneath those words. If, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. You know, it, it goes it, it beyond redemption. I think if we just stop with at redemption, we, we've, we, we've fallen short of what meaning there is there in the text. It, it drops deep into the veins of, of our abiding in Him, John chapter 15, where the, he, he the vine, we the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Unless we've died to the law, we cannot bear fruit unto God. You know, uh, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. We're not just looking at redemption. We're looking at abiding in Him in order to, to, to be able to, to produce... Actually, it's not us producing. It's Christ. It's, it's, you know, but producing the righteousness of God. Uh, you know, because this eating and this drinking is not something that we do just once, but we do it continuously until He comes. Paul is not evangelizing the saints here. Okay? I believe that the, the height of eating and drinking unworthily is to suggest that I had anything to do with my redemption. But I also believe that eating and drinking unworthily is to think that I have any righteousness in and of myself, that God depends on me. Well, you talk about a reversal of God's order. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Partaking of the Lord's Supper, not our Supper, the Lord's Supper, you know, is not something, something that we do. It's not something done to merit God's favor. It is God's people gathering together to consistently, present tense, rejoice in what Christ alone accomplished uh, in forgiving all our sins, granting us eternal life. That was the lesson being taught the disciples at the Lord's Last Supper. That's the Holy Spirit's message here in 1 Corinthians. Abiding in Him, trusting in Him, rejoicing in the perfect finished work of, of Christ on our behalf. That, that is, in my opinion, the equivalent of eating His flesh and drinking His blood. I, I want you to just take note of the words. Look at the words in the text here. You know, God. You know, Jesus is God. We see the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, His flesh, His body, His blood, our eating, our drinking, a, a better covenant, you know, in remembrance of Him. Our 
spiritual life or, or our spiritual condition does, does not depend upon a physical observance. You know, if you feasted on Christ in the Word, not, not, not yourself, not law, not but grace, and, and you know, gra law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. If, you're, if you do that and you never observe one single outward observance of the Lord's, you never partake of the Lord's su Supper in all actuality in your entire life, but you feasted on Christ in the Word, I believe you've done what He's, what he's asked us to do. Uh, our, our, our spiritual condition it, it doesn't depend upon a, a physical observance or, or some tradition a custom ordinance or anything else but on his blood his body his blood alone those communion elements are the illustration the type we have a lot of types in scripture you know I believe communion in the strictest Absolute, most absolute sense is an act of true worship and fellowship in the word of, of truth. It, it's certainly not some outward expression of some uncertain hope. The Lord's Supper carries along with it a bold assurance concerning a transaction that was finished. We don't gather together here for me to tell you how, how to live your life, how you ought to make God more pleased with your performance as a human being. What we do is we gather together to worship Him, to feast on Him. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. I want you to keep in mind that this, the context is Chris, our, our God's people here. Okay. In John chapter 6, anybody that did that without believing that he's God, a very God, would be, would be doing it in an unworthy manner. You know, anybody that, that did that thinking that they were the ones who were in one way or another responsible for the forgiveness of sin and going to heaven would be doing it in an unworthy manner, and that includes a lot of people today. I think it's included a lot of people all along the way. All of those detract from the person of, of Christ and the work of Christ. Either He did it all, folks, or He didn't. And when we gathered together to worship Him and just praise Him that, that we're, we were smart enough to accept Him, I think we're demeaning the person in the work of Jesus Christ. And I'd argue the unworthy manner is not that you had unconfessed sin in your life, you know, as though unconfessed sin means that it's not forgiven. Dearly beloved, your sins are not forgiven because you confess them, but because Jesus Christ died in your place. Now I recognize 1 John, if we confess, that is, if we say the same thing God says about our sin, He's faithful and just to, to forgive our sin. That, the word there is to move him aside. But that has to do with fellowship, with relationship, not redemption. John is speaking to believers who have been forgiven of all sin. What does God say about your sin? Well, he says he's forgiven it. Yes, Lord, that was... That was sin. I know that, and I know you forgave it. That's that's First John one nine confession, agreeing with God concerning sin. That the sin issue is settled. How many people take communion not believing that the sin issue is settled? That the Father's been satisfied. Uh, God's not commanding any one of His children to name all their, their known sins and, well, and good luck with the unknown ones, uh, you know, before, that they, before they can feast on Him. And if they don't, then they partake of those elements in an unworthy manner. That only the good Christians, you know, are allowed to take communion. You know, all the rest of you folks out there, you just, you got to go get your, 
life straightened out first and then come back and and do you honestly believe that We gathered together to drink the blood of Christ, to eat his body, to realize what he did in our place, our substitution, uh, so that we stand before God without spot, without blemish, by the blood of his cross. Not because I confessed anything or I did anything, but by the blood of his cross. I'm presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ not because of anything I did. I don't hear many sermons that preach on that, folks. I'm sorry, I don't. Maybe you do, I don't. There, there's always something that you gotta, you gotta do. No, it's about what he did. Christ is that stumbling block. He was for Israel, he is for many Christians today. They can't see Christ, they can't see past their own nose, you know, for Christ. The focus is entirely on self and law. So it seems to me that the height of unworthiness is to suggest that what Christ did was not enough. Let a man examine himself, says the text. What do you really believe? I, I, that's, I think that's a strong verse. You come together to study God's Word. Do you believe it's God's Word? Do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God of very God? And that it's He who speaks to us from the pages of this text? That they're not Paul's ideas, or John's, or Peter's. I mean, surely Paul wrote it, but Paul is writing what God has him write. God is speaking to us, and we are to discern his body. Discern. Look at the words. Look at the words here. That we're, gonna, we're gonna be looking at words. Weak, sick, sleep, guilt, condemnation, chastening, the world. Kind of scary kind of stuff, it seems. But it but it shouldn't be. I, I want to direct your attention to 2 Corinthians. We're not there yet. Uh, chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. Such is the confidence we have toward God through Christ, not that we are adequate in ourselves so as to consider anything as having come from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. There, that's... We see that in our current text right here. Not of the letter, that's law, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills. We're going to see that in, the, in our present text. But the Spirit gives life. Verse 7, verse 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. But if the ministry of death, there is a ministry of condemnation, folks. We're going to be seeing that word in the text. There's a ministry of death engraved in letters on stones. Verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness excel in glory. I want you to think about what we're looking at here. We're looking at the love of God for His people, which is so amazing that his concern here is for our conscience. Well, why should that surprise us? I mean, in, we've gone through several chapters where we've seen that that's been a consistent theme. We don't cause our brother to stumble. We don't want to defile his conscience. Uh, this word... The words are different here in the, in the, when we get down to the, the word for many, you know, many are, are uh, without strength is what the word, the, the actual Greek says weak is without strength. They, they, they're without strength. They're sickly. That is, the Greek word there is a chronic, chronic illness. 
That's what the word means, chronic illness. And many sleep. Now, you can take that as, as literal sleep. Well, there's three ways I see you can take the word sleep. It's sleep as if, like, you know, when I slept in my bed last night and I woke up this morning. That's, I slept through the night. That's, that's one way of looking at the word sleep. There's another way of looking at it, and that is it's often used for death. Uh, those who are asleep in the Lord. And then, it's, and then sometimes it's used in the sense of spiritual slothfulness or being not being watchful, not being awake, not being sober. We see that in 1 Thessalonians. We see that in, in other places. I was willing to suggest that sleep isn't here that's mentioned here is is not physical death you know awake of sleeper arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you that's figurative uh, do not sleep as do others. let us not sleep as do others that's in that's in first Thessalonians uh, chapter 5 that's that's figurative let us not sleep as do others. That's a command, by the way. Let us not sleep. So God is commanding us not to die. If you take that word sleep as die, he's, God's commanding us not to die. That doesn't make any sense. You know, it's easy to see, to see that word sleep and think, well, it's, it's used, he's being used figuratively here. and People aren't really dying for, not, for taking communion unworthily here. I mean, it's it, surely not. Surely that's not what the text is saying. It's, uh, you know, sleep's no different. Why can't sleep be taken figuratively? Sleep is no different than sit, walk, stand, run, rest, all of which are figurative, which we see in the text. You know, we, 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 we co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Uh, we, we walk worthily of our calling. We, we stand you know, strong, and, and uh, we run our race, we run, we rest, we rest in Him. I mean, why wouldn't sleep be, why couldn't we take that as figurative? I've always believed the meaning of a word depends upon the context. That is true. But in, in my examination of this particular instance of this mention of the word sleep, many, many of you are without strength, and the word many there is more than just a few. It means a whole lot. Many of you are without strength, is what the text is saying. Many of you have a chronic illness. You're chronically ill, okay? And then many of you, and now the word many there is different. It changes. You, you see in the English, there's two, two words there. Many is used twice, but the second time that it's used many, the word many there, is does isn't the same as the the first many it means it, it it doesn't it's not the same greek word he the holy spirit switches words to another word which we translated many but the word literally means there's been enough sufficient adequate number of those who have fallen asleep How often, folks, do we feast on Christ? We come to his, the Word. How often do we feast on Christ? Well, the very first video I did, verse by verse, when I began this this whole, went started going down this this path of verse by verse teaching. It was Ephesians. It was chapter one, verse one, right from the very beginning. If you go back and you look, I came out really hard and heavy right at the very beginning against this world religious system based on human merit because that's, that's what we see contrasted with the life of faith in Christ. And uh, that world religious system hates us. We were once a part of that. We were a part of that system uh, we're saved out of it, deliver, delivered out of it. As redeemed people, we are delivered out of it. 
for God so loved the world, that is the world religious system, that, you know, that's why he loved it, because we were once part of it. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation of those who are in Christ, so we get down to the to what it what it what looks like that we're we're you know we may be condemned with the world and and now all of a sudden we get you know this is this is up starting to appear a little spooky. Romans eight one no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, none, zero. God has nothing against you. You've been in fact you've been made the very righteousness of God in Christ. In this eating unworthily that we're looking at here, uh, I, I think it's the result of that, or it could be the cause. I don't know if it's the result or the cause, but one or the other, it's, there's a lack of spiritual comfort and peace. There's a loss of communion with God. Many, many of you probably can relate to this. It, it, it's, could it be a God withholding those... Uh, a withholding on his part of those spiritual comforts which might have been enjoyed which are imparted to those who observe it in a proper manner uh, I think that we see the world religious system based on human merit in this passage on the Lord's Supper that's what I think I think that we're, we're looking at a very, uh, almost looking at a reflection of our lives. Our op keep in mind that what Paul said. When we look at the text, right here. Now in this the, that I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. Divisions. Are there divisions today among Christians? I think you could, theologically, you could at least say that there are, there's a stark contrast between those who are looking at what Christ did as opposed to looking at what we must do for God. I think that's the division that, that, that Paul's referring to here. There has to be these divisions. And I partly believe it. Well, what, what does that mean, partly believe it? Well, I think, I think the reason the text we're reading, I, I think the reason Paul says, and I partly believe it, is because this is not the only area in which there's divisions. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating one, one takes before other his own supper. Okay? Folks, if, if we get together and... It's not about Christ. It's about us. And one person brings this food and this food and this food. Everybody brings their own food. We're not, ta we're not, looking at, we're not talking about the Word of God here. We're not talking about feasting on the, the living Word. But something else entirely. We're feasting on one another's Word. I think it's a beautiful illustration, a beautiful example of how that we can come together and feast upon ourselves and our own ideas and our own preconceived notions and, and how things we think things ought to be. One's hungry, another's drunken. One's hungry. Okay, one's one's not getting, you know, we we know we've known Christians like that. One is drunken. We've known Christians like that. If you want to look at that met metaphorically, if you want to look at that figuratively, you can get drunk on your own ideas, folks. What, have you not houses to eat and to drink in or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? He doesn't praise them in this. For I have received of the Lord. The Lord gave me this. This is what I, I received of Him, that I delivered unto you. 
that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, my blood. This do ye as often, often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Does that mean he's going to hell? No. No. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And surely, Steve, the guy's going to hell here. No, he's not. No, he's not going to hell. This is God's love letter, folks, to His people. And it's for this cause that many, more than a few, are weak, that is, without strength, and sickly. They're chronically ill among you, and many sleep. Now the word many is sufficient, adequate. There's been enough. Go to sleep. It is a present tense. God the Holy Spirit, I believe, is saying to us, that there's been enough, go to sleep. Over, over I don't know, I guess over, maybe over the course of his, the time of history, uh, as history's run its course, since, since the beginning up till now, there's been enough, go to sleep, in that condition in which they never came out of it. They ate, they drank unworthily until God took them home. Why does that surprise us? Uzzah, God struck him dead for straightening up the ark, or for thinking that he, God needed his help. Okay? Ananias and Sapphira, lying to the Holy Spirit. How about all those that perished in the wilderness? All those that perished in the wilderness, they, they went to hell. What about the sin in, unto death that we see in 1 John? If we see our, southern, our brother sinning a sin not unto death, there is a sin unto death. We can die in a state of never having come out of eating and drinking unworthily. I believe is what the text is saying. Now, I could be wrong. I, I don't ask anybody to agree with me, but that's how I, I look at it. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That's not judgment. There's no judgment for the... There's, that's not... That doesn't violate Romans 8, 1. Or, you know, uh, there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. God judges His people. We, we have judgment lo looming ahead of us. We are approaching, fastly approaching His near return. There's the judgment seat of Christ. But when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord. The word chastened is child training. In order that we should not be condemned with the world. The world. The one, that's the world, folks. The world that hates us. that will put us to death thinking that it's doing God's service. It's the world that rejected, outright rejected, and were repulsed by, the, by any suggestion, any idea that God did the choosing. Many of his disciples, when they heard that, walked, went away and walked no more with him. The world religious system, based on human merit. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Wait for one another, and, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Folks, I've spent a many, a many hours, many days, many weeks, months, years now, okay, talking about our life in Christ and how it's contrasted with that world religious system based on human merit. And we're looking at a, situ a context in which we're, the, the Lord's Supper is, is, is placed at the forefront of our thinking here 
communion, the Lord's Supper, eating and drinking unworthily. And I believe there's a direct connection to that drink, eating and drinking unworthily and that world religious system based on human merit. And that, when it comes into the observance of the Lord's Supper, can be something that we want to avoid. God has so blessed us. I believe He's so concerned that about us sharing in all of those blessings that He's given us in Christ. I think it breaks His heart to see us taking communion unworthily, feasting on anything and everything other than Jesus Christ. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.